Welcome to the Real Talk Theology Podcast, where everyone is a theologian. Whether you believe in God or just have thoughts about God, we invite you to join us as we discuss doctrine for everyday life. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Talk Theology Podcast. I am Brock and I'm here with Chris Coleman and and Aaron Mitchell. (laughs) What's up guys, what's up? Hey, we know that Easter is right around the corner. This episode should be dropping on the Thursday before Good Friday, which is before Easter Sunday. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about the resurrection. But before we do that, uh, guys, I love candy. And specifically, Easter is a time when when some good candy is highlighted. And so I want to know, what is your top Easter candy and what is your bottom Easter candy? Like, what what's the best? What's the thing that you hope is in your Easter basket? Any of you guys get Easter Without, baskets growing up? Anybody? Yes. Uh, I, some. Yeah. I'm, I'm an unorthodox. only child. Okay. I'm an only child, which means I still get Easter baskets from from yikes. my parents. Oh wow, that's rough. yikes! Yeah, Megan loves it because she didn't have Easter baskets growing up, so we, we we just pretend like it's for her. But what's your in a what's weird your, way that kind of skews my image of you? That really? In my head. Yeah. Really? Yeah, Man, it really does. Like I knew you were an only child, but it's like still getting Easter baskets. How old are you now? You wouldn't be excited if around Easter time someone just showed up and gave you a basket full of candy and gift cards. Gift cards, yes. Gift I cards suppose. are nice. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. that changes it a little. But the Thank candy you. thing, I'm like, Thank oh, okay. you. Well. All right, what's your top Easter candy and your bottom? The Easter bottom, candy? I can tell you immediately. Those peeps are disgusting. Peeps, peeps are pretty are bad. Garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Peeps are garbage. We agree. It's like a, it's like a generic marshmallow, <laughs> but. It, it's like weirdly chewy, and but it's like crunchy too. It's like crystallized. I don't know. I'm not and, a fan. It's and just such an unnatural color for a marshmallow. I'm pretty too, sure they like, came out with Peep's cereal. Oh, that's okay. So, so that's, that's your bottom. What's your top? Man, my top is probably. Uh, man, I like Cadbury eggs a lot. Cadbury uh, eggs. I don't even know what that yeah, means. Yeah, I do. Like it's like Cadbury a eggs. fancy chocolate egg wrapped in. Like caramel. Well, they have different versions. So the oh, really? peanut butter one is really good, but Ooh. then they, they have the original Cadbury. Which is like know, a chocolate, huh. cover, chocolate with caramel on the inside. Caramel and cream, yeah, yeah. on the inside. Aaron? Yeah, so no, Peeps, absolutely bottom. It's the worst. Absolutely, okay. the worst. Um, Honestly, worse than like Twizzlers to me, and Twizzlers are, are gross. Twizzlers are delicious. Uh, I love wrong. Twizzlers. Oh, Although, bad. I take those overseas with me sometimes. They don't have those in a lot of countries. Really? And, uh, and so I bring it as my snack because I like them and I know it's something they don't have, but it's a mixed bag. Like when I give them to people, especially in the Middle East, I give them to them there and they, they're like, it's like chewing on a wire is the, <laughs> yeah. is the response I get okay. most often. Yeah, but, and then my favorite though is a Reese's, or yeah, a Reese like Easter egg. Uh, did you say Reese? I know I say it wrong, but you know what I mean. It's the chocolate peanut butter Easter egg. If you're talking about okay. Reese, I don't. I don't know what you mean. Reese's. 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 Okay. Reese's. Yeah. My bad. So the okay. Reese's eggs. Yeah. The, the yeah. Because it just tastes like a. That's Reese's probably cup. my favorite. I, I'm a sucker for jelly beans, though. I love any type Ooh, of like chewy, beans, yeah. like sweet, tangy candy. And so jelly bean, especially like the Starburst jelly beans. Oh yeah. Oh, those yeah. are. I'm with solid. Yeah. Low. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Peeps, but I would eat Peeps before I ate like Robin eggs, like the malted milk type things. Yeah, that makes sense. Not a huge fan. Yeah. I well. Like those. While you guys are lonely without an Easter basket, I will be enjoying mine on Easter Sunday. But what we'll also be enjoying on Easter Sunday is celebrating the resurrection. And today, we simply wanted to talk through some of the evidences that we have that the resurrection isn't just something that that you know we talk about on Easter, but it's something that we can have uh, assurance to to believe that there's there's actually evidence for that there's a, a historical evidences for the resurrection. And so we're going to begin to just talk today, why is it that we put so much hope, so much stock, so much faith, so much belief in this event, that this event took place on Easter? So as we're going into this topic, uh, there is a question, did Jesus really raise from the dead? There's a lot of myths about people in the past, whether it's in um, you know mythology or uh, just fables, where people have risen from the dead, but is this something, as far as Christianity is concerned, that it really happened? And uh, Chris, why don't you start us out? Are are there any explanations that some people give to just explain away the resurrection as if it's not something that really took place? Well, 
Yeah, there's there's actually a list of those that I commonly hear. Uh, so part of my role with the Arkansas Baptist State Convention is doing apologetics, and so uh, of course the resurrection is a. I mean, it's a hot, hot topic. Hot topic, and so uh, you have a few different common secular explanations that float around out there. Uh, one of them is simply that the Bible stories have been changed through the years. Hmm. Uh, that the the manuscripts that we have today are are not what was originally written. Um, but when you dig into manuscript evidence concerning the New Testament in particular, I mean, we have over 5,600 copies of the New Testament like in the original Koine Greek that right. it was written in. And uh, the accuracy rate with those is 99.5% between the different manuscripts that we have. Now, what makes up for that 0.5% difference? Uh, well, part of that is you do have partial manuscripts because we find manuscripts, of course, that are right. that have been messed up over the years. But some of it's scribal notes where mm-hmm. there's been notes put there that we don't know how to handle that in the codex. But a large portion of them are actually spelling mistakes, wow. um, and which is a neat thing, really, because what we can do is we can look at individual spelling mistakes, like on a fifth century document, and we can know that that it's called parent daughter documentation. We right. know that this fifth century document is a daughter of this fourth century right. one from this. To trace it back, we can trace it back. So, of that 0.5 percent difference, there's nothing critical or crucial that that we believe or the doctrine of Christianity is founded on based on anything that's questionable. Absolutely not. Not one bit of it has anything to do with about who God is, who we are in relationship to God, what Christ came to accomplish on the cross, uh, and, and the resurrection itself. Mm-hmm. Our topic today, none of those variations uh, impact that in the least bit. So, if the the manuscripts, if if the evidence of of the text can be trusted, what are some other explanations? Uh, that are common uh, to explain away the resurrection. Man, honestly, some of them are just stupid. To be honest, <laughs> like I, and I've heard a whole gamut of them, especially being in countries where sometimes they don't even know really for sure what they believe within Islam, for example. But uh, but then they hear false things about us. One of them is that Mary and the disciples went to the wrong tomb, mm-hmm. which I'm like. Really, though? I mean, because <laughs> you have a whole bunch of Roman guards who would have been around right. this. And uh, obviously a pretty pivotal pivotal moment for them. Yeah. And they were the ones who wrapped this body in over 100 pounds of these different spices and all these things, this gummy substance, and, and placed it in there. Mm-hmm. And you, you're saying they went to the wrong tomb. It's really not giving them much credit. It's like you really think they were... Well, that unintelligent? And when they started proclaiming the resurrection right after, it would have been easy for the Jewish authorities to go, uh, actually, right over here, <laughs> yeah. know, there's this tomb that we have the body in and it's still sealed. Um, another one is the, what's called the swoon theory. Uh, is that, that what happens when Aaron sees a, a pretty girl? That's exactly what wow. right. wow. does that's that even exactly mean? What is, I don't even know. What? You don't, you've never heard of swooning? Swooning. No, I've heard of rizzing, and I have that This now. This guy is, is a little too young. Yes. Or yes, we're too old. Well, to use the word riz. Uh, charisma, you know, man. Come on. Yeah, I, I, you had to explain it to me the other day. and I You heard it here first. Aaron is a charismatic. There you go. <laughs> At least with the ladies, hey, apparently. If the resurrection <laughs> is true, as we're talking about today, then if you're not charismatic a little bit about that, I don't know if you believe the resurrection. All right. All right. Boom, there you go. Depends on your definition of charismatic. Oh. All right. Fired so the Jesus. swoon theory would be that Jesus actually didn't die on the cross. Right. That, that he swooned or he uh, passed out or became unconscious for a time. Yeah. Uh, and so that's just stupid. So first off, you're going to say that this guy, after going through a horrible, horrible beating, like having his flesh ripped off his body by these whips, having a crown of thorns placed on him, having nails driven through his hands and feet, mm. having a spear thrust through his side into the pericardial sac, more than likely based on the blood and water coming out. Yeah. That uh, with all that, he actually didn't die. He just passed out for a while. Then he was wrapped in over 100 pounds of materials, which, you know, you don't breathe through well. Uh, like, I don't know if you, about yeah. you guys, like if you breathe with the, or if you sleep with a blanket over your head, like, you feel like you're suffocating at yeah. times. Unless yet, you know, you got a hundred pounds of materials wrapped around. Right. And um and then he was put into a tomb where th- for three days without medical attention, he mm-hmm. laid there and then just got up, rolled away the stone, and walked off. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, none of this makes any sense mm-hmm. whatsoever. Uh, all so all that, I can think of in my mind is that that scene from Monty Python on the Holy Grail when it's like, it's only a flesh wound. It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and not only that, but we see like in the gospel narrative, we also see where it talks about the disciples were on the road to Emmaus. Like mm-hmm. it's a seven mile journey between these two points. Yeah. And it says that Jesus caught up with them. Yeah. Like this guy just had nails driven through his feet. Like if we stub our toe hard enough or break it, you're trying to walk with a broken toe. Right. Like you walk like your hips are disjointed. And you're mm-hmm. saying he caught up 
with them on a seven mile journey. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, the swoon theory to me is just that's one of the more ridiculous. In a short things. amount of time after he's resurrected, oh, I, he's he's eating, he's walking around. I mean, obviously he he's not carrying the same marks on his face or on his body um, uh, from from being just torn to shreds. Uh, you, you would think if he's kind of limped out of the grave, not, not to mention how do you get the stone out of the way in the first place? But he he's he's not going to look like the victorious resurrected king. This dude's going to look like a guy who just got his tail kicked in the the cage of an MMA fight. Yeah. I mean. He would not have looked. It would have been noticeable that that he had been on the cross. Well, yep, that's uh, it's, so. To me, the swoon theory, and that's a one in the Middle East in particular. I hear that one quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, another it one. Also, is, another thing on that is is these Roman guards who were watching him. The 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 one who was at the foot of the cross. Like these are hardened warriors. Like they know death. So it's also in, in the same way that thinking Mary and the, the other disciples went to the wrong tomb, that doesn't really give them much credit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also doesn't give much credit and and underestimates those Roman guards, those those soldiers, to think that they wouldn't ever they wouldn't even be able to truly recognize if someone was dead or not. Yeah. I mean it's it's ridiculous. Well and that kind of leads into one of the other theories that you also hear is that the, the body was stolen by the disciples. Hmm. All right. So this is the same disciples who were cowering in fear. I mean, one of them denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed in the middle of the whole thing, to yeah. quote the scripture. And so, like, obviously they were afraid. Yeah. And so you're saying these fearful fishermen and tax collectors and whatever, not trained hardened soldiers. They only had that one they sword. arrived. Yes. And they Jesus took sword. it from them. Yeah, Jesus took it for them after <laughs> you know. Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, <laughs> and so, so they overpowered a Roman guard. Yeah. They moved. They broke the Roman seal. They moved a multi-ton stone from a, in front of this tomb and took the body. Like, yeah. that's just ridiculous. Like, there's no way that happens. Yeah. Did we talk about hallucination that the appearances of Christ? Well, those he didn't really appear. These were just dramatic experiences where where folks hallucinated seeing Jesus. Aaron, have you ever heard anything on that theory before? Yeah, I mean, I've heard a little bit about it, and I just, I think that if it's so many, just logic and through it in my brain, you know, so many people saw it. So many people witnessed exactly. Jesus afterwards. I'm like, like, there's some crazy people in the world, but there's not that many, like, crazy people all in one area that are just like, oh, we saw him. And plus, so many people were out to get him and were out to prove him wrong that, like, I'm sure that, like, the the skeptics would have said uh, they don't see anybody, and mm -hmm. you know we we never see that in scripture. We never see that recorded because you know what was it over five hundred people witnessed yeah. him after the yeah. resurrection, and it's like out of those five hundred people, there had to be a skeptic somewhere yeah. that was just mind blown. By. And that's the the thing you've got to, to realize is that when we're talking about hallucinations, there's no documentation in psychology, sociology, of mass hallucinations. Right. Exactly. Shared mass hallucinations. Exactly. They're the, all seeing the same thing. Yeah. There are examples of individuals seeing some type of vision or having a, a hallucinating experience, but nowhere on the scale that we see the, the, the Bible recording Jesus appearing to these multitudes, nowhere is a mass shared hallucination recorded. There's no evidence that that's even possible or has ever taken place. Well, and not even, and we're talking about evidence of the resurrection itself. So we're dealing with first century information here. Right. But if you, even if you go into modern Christianity, because there was a talk where Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, was on stage, hmm. and a Christian stood up and asked him about, like, well, what about all the millions of Christians around the world and through the centuries who've had a personal relationship with this Jesus Christ that you're mm -hmm. saying either never existed or didn't rise from the dead? And uh, in Richard Dawkins' uh, response was essentially, well, they're hallucinating. Hmm. Like, you're talking about a shared hallucination, not just with these original 500, yeah. but you're talking about Since then. through the centuries, people say, not that we visually see Jesus standing there, but we have a personal relationship with Christ. Right. And so, you know, what does that even look like then? What Are we, are we all hallucinating? Right. Um, so, yeah, those are the common secular explanations, and there's some others, but they all really fall around the same set of arguments uh, that, that just don't hold up to the facts. Right. Uh, and so, like, if you if you're familiar with evidential apologetics, which is really it leans on 
the the case for the resurrection. Um, William Lane Craig does more classical apologetics, but eventually classical apologetics leads into evidential apologetics. Probably one of the biggest named evidential apologetics, Gary Habermas, mm -hmm. is is famous for saying it's just the facts. Let's get to the facts. What are the facts, and let's use those facts to represent um, what we can credibly believe or not believe. I think for for a lot of people, you look at uh, the story of guys like Josh McDowell. Um, you look at the story of of guys like even um, a Lee guy that Strobel. We, Lee, Lee Strobel, the guy we had, uh, Bobby Conway, recently. A lot of them, their, their understanding of Christianity. Um, what's the the uh, the other guy, Jay Warner Wallace, Jay Warner Wallace, very similar folks who were very skeptical at some point in their lives and ultimately came to be convinced because of what they saw and the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, so if, if we can get settled on the resurrection, really that's what everyone has to deal with the resurrection. Yeah. Did it happen or did it not happen? Once you deal with the resurrection, that can help you come to terms and settle a lot of other maybe issues or hangups that you have. So let's just talk about the facts well, the for the, the day, re resurrection. Jesus was a liar. Yeah. Because he said he would be resurrected. Right. He's a lunatic or he is Lord. Yeah. And so you have to decide where you're going to fall on that, but based on the facts, mm -hmm. not just based on even just feelings. So yeah. let's talk about one of, a few of the facts here. Uh, were you going to say something here? Oh, no, I'm good. Well, I was going to quote First Corinthians 15 where it just said, like, just kind of that reminder as believers is like the audience and for us, like if the resurrection didn't happen, we have nothing. We're right. still in our sins. We're, you know— we, we, we don't have anywhere to go. And so, like, our hope is all in the resurrection. We, uh, I was at an event recently with Shane Pruitt, and he says that oftentimes when we share the gospel, we're like, Jesus died for our sins. And Shane was just kind of like, and? 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 <laughs> Come on, like, yeah. he's risen, baby. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so if we don't have the resurrection, we don't have hope. And so that's the emphasis of this episode. And this is actually one of my favorite episodes so far, uh, just sitting here, because it's like, this, this is what hypes me up. And, you know, I heard a song recently that said Friday is good. We call it Good Friday, not because what happened on Friday, but because Sunday was coming. Sunday is like just around the corner. And that, Jesus that new Phil Wilkins single? Dude, I lo I've i listened to that <laughs> it's a good on song. repeat for it's a good song. days. But anyway, it's great. So Yeah, I've, I heard one time someone was talking, uh, preaching, and they're like, so often when we're preaching, our preaching leaves Jesus on the cross. A lot of times our preaching can leave Jesus in the tomb, but our preaching ought to lead to to showing that Jesus is risen from the grave. Yeah. So, yeah. so Chris, what what are some of the facts then for the resurrection? Well, first off, I mean, you have that Roman seal that is very explicitly there. Uh, the Gospels all record it. Uh, the fact that the tomb was covered with a and this seal is uh, this is a series of ropes, and this is a series, uh, and then a, an actual seal, a stamp type thing that's placed across the multi-ton uh, stone that's been rolled in front. And uh, guys, the penalty for breaking this seal, the equivalent of the Roman FBI, CIA, jumps into action if the Roman seal is broken. And so the fact that this seal was broken is, is a huge thing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the Roman seal to contend with is, is one of those things. And so uh, who broke the seal is a question that comes up then. It, was it the disciples? Well, again, they got to overcome this Roman guard. Uh, and guard, actually, there, it's not a singular guard, which we in our English sometimes think. Uh, so coming from a military background like I am, you, you think in terms of uh, squads, platoons, companies, battalions, so forth and so mm -hmm. on. And so guard is actually a unit of measurement for a number of troops. And so this is this is quite a few soldiers that are there in front of this tomb who are highly trained individuals. And for them, if the Roman seal gets broken, their job is to guard that seal. If it's broken, the penalty for them is death. Mm -hmm. And so that their lives are based on So sometimes people will say, well, maybe they fell asleep. It was the middle of the night when this happened. I'm like, no, no disciplined soldier or group of soldiers is allowing all of them to be asleep at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not when their lives are dependent on it. Yep. So the, the fact that the seal is broken to begin with. Uh, second, that the, that the stone was rolled away. Mm -hmm. Again, multi-ton stone rolled in front of this cave entrance. And you're saying this thing was rolled away. But it's not just, uh, if you read the Gospels, it's not just saying that it was rolled away. It says up in a way. Like it wasn't just rolled to the side. It was like rolled far out of the way and you know, kind of up the edge of the ridge from yeah. the way they describe it. And so you're talking about a multi-ton stone that's not only being moved, but moved up and out of the way, um, which we know from the gospel accounts that the angel was the one who actually did this moving. Uh, but the fact is the stone was rolled away. Uh, seals broken, stones rolled away. And then you have the empty tomb itself. Um, it would have been very, 
very easy uh, to squash Christianity in its infancy mm-hmm. if it wasn't for the fact that that tomb was empty. Right. Mm. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus' body could not be produced by the Jewish authorities mm-hmm. or the Roman authorities, that then this would have all ended quickly. But they couldn't produce that body. Right. Yeah. Um, you guys have any comments on that part, or I can keep on working through some facts here. No, I think uh, it, it's important to to point out because you even see in the gospel accounts there's this whole cover up scheme um, where where they're trying to to give an explanation for how it was, and that's where you see them making that same argument that the disciples came and and stole the body, which again is is an insult to all those soldiers to say that this ragtag group of of eleven guys. Um, with one sword, came and overpowered a, a, a group of hardened Roman soldiers um, and were somehow able to to get Jesus' body. But then that still doesn't explain for all of the appearances of Jesus after the fact. And it talks about how that that was the story that was still being promoted um, at the time. Uh, but but we see that wasn't true. But exactly all they got to do in order to, to squash this whole thing is is to bring out the body of Jesus and say, y'all are a bunch of liars. Yep, that was it. And not well, and to go a step further then with the Roman guards, not only did they had to get by the Roman guards, but even after the resurrection happens, it records that the Roman guards fled. That's AWOL. They're mm-hmm. committing AWOL. Mm-hmm. Like these disciplined soldiers just left their post. And uh so not only has the seal been broken, not only is the tomb been opened and now is empty, but they're leaving their post, which means right. something dramatic happened here for these disciplined yeah. men to flee from this scene of this crime. Yeah, and there's something else that this leads to is if if the disciples came and somehow they overpower this this Roman these Roman soldiers, they somehow figure out how to roll the stone away. They somehow figure out how to get Jesus's body out. They somehow take the time not to rush away, and the you would think the noise and the commotion would cause people, yet they, they unwrap the body and they fold it and they put it there neatly. Then they take the body, they somehow hide the body where it's never found again. Don't you think at least one of them at some point would have cracked under the pressure when it came time to, to lose their lives? Uh, Aaron, if, if you're concealing yeah. a lie and all of a sudden that lie is about to get your head on the chopping block— like, don't you think you or someone that you've shared it with at some point is going to step up and be like, wait, 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 like, <laughs> just take the sword away. Sure. Just kidding. Oh, yeah. It, well, even Thomas. I mean, Thomas is the guy that I think of the most because hmm. when it comes to being a skeptic and being a follower of Jesus, you know, we all have our doubts and we all have those, right. those seasons of doubt where we struggle. We look at Thomas. Thomas would be the first to run. Thomas yeah. would have been the first to be like, see, I told you guys that this was all a scam. I told you guys that this was all fake. But the fact that Thomas sticks around and then we <clears throat> we see that Jesus um, shows Thomas his wounds and le- allows him to f- feel the wounds and, and mm-hmm. feel Jesus and realize that it's real. Yeah, Thomas was out to – Thomas is that that Christian, that Christ follower that we all know, that our friend of ours that's just like – really prove it to us. Yeah. Like, and then if you, if you prove it to them, they're like, but what about this? Yeah. What about this? And just, I feel like just, you can use all the disciples, but Thomas is the one we can narrow it down to and be like, man, if there was anybody that was out to disprove Jesus as a follower of Jesus, it was Mm -hmm. him. And so, yeah. And and for me personally, I mean, I would, yeah, I'm, I want to follow the truth. I want to follow what is right. And these guys are coming from uh, sort of a Jewish um, background. And if being a Jew was right, then I'm sure they were like, oh, this Jesus guy was a scam. Back to my Jewish ways. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, if this isn't right, then I'm going to follow this instead. But the fact that they take it to the point of death, other than just one of them, you know, like Mm -hmm. uh, they take it to the point of death shows the seriousness. Now, by no means am I saying if someone's willing to die for something, that automatically makes it true. But when so much is on the line with Jesus on whether is this right or is this wrong, and you see the devotion that these ha- these guys and uh, and women poured into following mm-hmm. Jesus wholeheartedly, it, it just kind of makes me scratch my head to think that, like, yeah, they did it all for nothing. You know, maybe one lunatic would do it here and there, but 12 of them plus the thousands of followers that would come after just the 12 disciples mm-hmm. that were laying it all out as eyewitnesses for Jesus— 
I logically can't wrap my head around that being, there being it, that many. It people. also well, and all these witnesses. You also have hostile witnesses. Correct. You got to account for. Yeah. I mean, in a court of law, you have witnesses that are family members or whatever. You know, that are obviously going to give some sort of testimony, even if they perjure themselves at times. Right. Yeah. To say that what you're saying is actual, but you're talking about hostile witnesses, and even later on, after this initial resurrection, after the ascension, you have a, one particular hostile witness. Paul. Paul the Apostle. Yeah. And, I mean, who is Saul at this point? you got to figure out how does he have the radical conversion that he has if it's not for coming in contact with the resurrected Christ? Because yep. he wasn't, because again, he wasn't seeking Jesus. It's one of those things where, like... He was seeking to stamp he was, stamp out he any was, work of Jesus. Yeah, it's it's the story of Lee Strobel or Jay Warner Wallace or all these, uh, you know, all these different guys who studied and researched, like, I'm going to disprove this Jesus. And they just get stumped. And, and I think that's uh, even more of a powerful witness and testimony uh, to the goodness of Jesus and his resurrection and just his power that he holds as king. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. Well, and I often, and, and outside of even all the scriptural and nature and character of God and theological arguments for perseverance of the saints, the fact that mm-hmm. we're once saved, always saved, for me, it's a simple thing of if you've really met the same Jesus I've met, there's no walking away. That's the question. Did you meet the Jesus I've met? Yeah, for sure. Paul, obviously, who saw originally, met the Jesus mm-hmm. that I've met. I mean, this guy never walked away. And all guys, all of these disciples, and including Paul in with these disciples in this case, all these disciples suffered horrific deaths with the exception of one, Yeah, John. Yep. And they tried to boil him alive. He mm-hmm. wouldn't die. So they exile him to Patmos, where God gives him the book of Revelation. Yeah. And he eventually comes back and lives in Ephesus and uh, finishes out the rest of his life there. But... But all these guys died horrific deaths. Yeah. And uh, you talk to anybody that's military or has worked in intelligence before, and uh, guys, torture only does so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody's going to die for a lie at the end mm-hmm. of the day. They'll yeah. die for what they believe in. They'll die for the truth, but they're not going to die for a lie. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, it's like you said a little while ago, all right, all right, I give, I give. But yeah. you're not yeah. talking about just one person. You're talking about a whole group of people. And the other thing, too, is assuming that they had the ability to overcome these Roman guards, assuming they had the ability to do all these things, assuming somehow they manifest an appearance of Jesus to over 500 people afterwards. Right. Um, guys, when it comes to keeping secrets, like if the secret gets out yeah. past one person, nobody keeps a secret long term. Yeah. It's the whole thing of conspiracy yeah. theories. Like mm-hmm. at a certain point, they fall apart because nobody's keeping that level of secret. Right. Hey, can I can I add something to what Chris was saying there? Sure. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned is like no one no one dies for a lie and I, I can't help but think there's probably that one person in the audience thinking well what about islam and so just to, if i could attempt to answer that question um of why people are dying for islam all the time and why are there you know well they don't attempt- perceive it to be a lie right exactly <laughs> they don't perceive it to be a lie but also there's a there's a different weight i feel like with islam it's almost like you're guarantee like you're guaranteeing yourself this with your God because you're trying to please your God with with our Jesus that we follow with the God we follow he gave his life and we should be willing to give ours but there's not that uh, I would say there's not that legalistic pressure of like if I don't die for the sake of Jesus if I don't die and you know on there's the not a martyr field, complex there's there's not one of those things where God's just like oh if you die brownie points it's like yeah. hey if I call you to die you better be willing but it's not this legalistic weight of like the right. the, the 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 whole the jihad is that mm-hmm. what it is and so I just story. wanted to to, to clarify that, of, and I think that's great, but there's legalism in all of our other religions to their point of death because they're deceived. But with Jesus, he just calls us to follow, and as believers, we follow to whatever degree that may be. So there's all these facts that surround whether or not the resurrection happened, and one of the things that I think can be so helpful if you're talking to a friend who who's maybe skeptical or perhaps they're an atheist, um, they don't they don't believe that the Bible is inspired. They're not starting with those same level of assumptions about the the biblical text and the accounts that we have. The good thing with evidential apologetics and specifically the the case for the resurrection is is a lot of these facts are accepted by critical scholars, um, even those who who would reject inspiration of scripture, who would even come to a different conclusion and say that you know Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Facts like the tomb being empty, um, Jesus's disciples having some type of experience believing that Christ is risen, um, the the. The result of preaching and these disciples after the resurrection, um, having the resurrection at the center, and the Christian establ- church is establishing and growing, and people are, are willing to die. Like a lot of these things are historical facts that even critical scholars accept. So it gives us common ground to to. 
to lift up these pieces of evidence and and challenge people what they're what they're going to do with them in the end. Well, and coming back to the question that I raised earlier, at the end of all this, as you look at the facts, as you examine the evidence, you have to ask yourself, was Jesus lying, which the mm-hmm. evidence and the facts say no? Was he just straight out crazy? He be- he believed, you know, that he was going to raise yeah. from the dead. Was he a lunatic or is he really Lord? Yep. And that's the question, as you guys are out there listening now, that you've got to weigh yourself. Uh, where do you fall on this decision? Is, is Jesus a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he a Lord? Absolutely. And so we hope that this is helpful leading into the Easter season. Who knows? Maybe there's someone in your life, friend, uh, family member, coworker, who you could have a conversation with and just simply ask them about the resurrection. Bring up some of these facts and, and present to them the opportunity of, of the decision that they have to make for themselves, just like all of us have to make for themselves. We thank you for tuning in for another week of Real Talk Theology. And until next time, don't, don't stop believing. believing.